Welcome, Crossbridge. Good to see you all. Yeah, nice to see you. It's good. Uh, thumbs up for everyone. Great job making it today. I'm really glad to see all of you. Double thumbs up to those of you joining us online and in Peru. Always great to see you here. As we get started in our new series today, let me ask you a question. How many of you have ever had interac interactions with other human beings before? Right. A few of us. How many of you would say that some of those interactions have gone well? Some of them. Anyone have some interactions that went less than well? Let's take just a moment and turn to your neighbor and tell them the worst interaction you've ever had. No, we're not going to do that. That's a, that's a bad idea, right? Because they're like, some of them are here right now. That's not good. I get that, but it's interesting, isn't it? When it comes to interactions with other human beings, there's a wide scope of things that can take place. Some of those moments, I think, are best visualized like this. Oh, the hug and warm, fuzzy feelings, and I can't believe we get to be friends or family, and that some of those other interactions look a little more, well, like this. How many of you have siblings because they know exactly what that's like? Yeah, quite a few of us. Um, the reality is some of those interactions can look something like this, a little bit of celebration. We're so glad that we get to be friends, we get to work together, and, and yet others maybe look a little more like this. Some fights breaking out, maybe even right here in your place of worship. What I'm saying is, if I were to break down human interactions in the far ends of the spectrum, I would say some of them are these hallmark-type moments, these moments where there's joy and happiness and love and rainbows and sunshine and lollipops, and we love those moments. On the other end of the spectrum, there are interactions like this. Get ready for some professional wrestling because you just felt like you just got an elbow from the top rope from a friend or a coworker. We call these relationships, and welcome to the world in which we live. It's interesting, if you're anything, if your relationships are anything like mine, the scope of which our relationships can fall. Some of those moments, you're just blown away. You never knew that you could laugh so hard with that friend, and just a few moments later, you never knew you could be so frustrated with the very same person. That vein in the forehead begins to throb. Why would you do something like that? You never knew you could love someone as dearly as you love that family member of yours and then turn right around and never knew you could be so angry at the very same person. Some of the depths of joy and then moments that turn to just the depths of sorrow can happen within that same relationship. It's interesting, isn't it? That's why today we're kicking off a brand new series called Real Relationships, The Art of Peopling. Because as long as you are in relationships with other human beings, there will be hallmark moments and professional wrestling moments and moments in between. And knowing how we handle all of those moments, no matter what end of the spectrum you find yourself on, will determine to a large extent the satisfaction and the plans and the purposes that God has for your relationships. And we want to help you discover that art of peopling. So this is for you. If you've ever found yourself saying, my parents or grandparents or guardians just don't get it. My, they're so hashtag lame, right? <laughs> or maybe you've said, I, I don't know how to talk to my kids. I don't speak TikTok. And so I, I need a little help. How do I people these amazing little humans that I have interaction with? If you've ever wondered how to speak to your spouse or with a friend that you're not sure where it is now because they haven't talked to you for a while, they haven't texted back for a moment, peopling across the board. So if you're single, if you're divorced, if you're widowed, if you're married, if you're in a relationship that you're not exactly sure what to even call this relationship relationship, if you are any person that deals with peopley people, this series is for you. So do me a favor, tell your neighbor it's for you. It's for you because you're here with other people -y people. That's right. So now that we've kind of set the bar for everyone, I want to let you know we're doing something extra special. I'm really excited about this. Pastor Sherry already shared it with you. We're doing what's called the Relationships Challenge. I pray that you don't just think about this when we talk about it during the weekend, but throughout the week, you're going to have opportunities to live these things out. So we're going to encourage you for this Relationship Challenge, the photo scavenger hunt this week. Grab your friends or your family, or what a great chance to make some new friends. Good way to live out the principles we're going to be talking about today. Now, today we're going to be talking about one of the most vital principles that is necessary for any relationship to take it to the next level, to be thriving, next level, excellent. I want you to know that no matter what relationship you find yourself in, if you do this well, you'll find greater fulfillment, 
Discover more of God's plans and purposes for your relationship, and it is so critically important. What is it? I'm glad you hypothetically asked. We're going to find that out today. So however you're reading God's message, turn with me to James chapter 1, verse 19. One verse jam-packed with practical insight and wisdom. And I pray you brought God's message tonight on your phone. You brought your Bible with you. Don't miss out on the opportunity to dive into God's Word, His living and active Word. Make sure you've got something to take notes. You've downloaded the Crossbridge app and you've popped open to take message notes. My friends, there is some transformational truth from God's Word today, and I don't want you to miss it. Don't miss the message in the Word that God has for you today. So would you please stand with me as we honor the reading of God's message today. James 1 Verse 19, this is what God's message says to us. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Would you pray with me today? Lord, such incredibly practical wisdom and insight. And right now, I just pray that we will hear it with a new, fresh set of ears. Lord, I've been praying for revival to break forth. I've been praying for a, a fresh renewal of you, Holy Spirit, to pour down. And I know that in moments just like this, when hearts are open, when we hunger for you, and all the drama gets put on the side, and we say, Lord, more than anything else, just want to hear your voice. Lead and guide us. Transform Every single one of our relationships, no matter where it is, friendships, families, dating relationships with our kids, our in-laws, everyone, may they all be on the table tonight for you to do what only you can do in them. Holy Spirit, flow through this place in a way that no one leaves the same as when they came in, but that we've all genuinely encountered your presence in this place today. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Since we're on the topic of getting real with relationships, I felt like it'd be important for us to hear some real insights, some real thoughts from some people, a group of people who knows all too well what it's like to keep it real. Kids, okay? Kids have a tendency of keeping it real, don't they? And so we thought it'd be fun during this series to ask some of our very own kids Some wisdom questions about relationships. And every week through this series, you're going to get a chance to hear from our very own kids. And yes, we did ask their parents and guardians if it was okay to interview them, okay? But we wanted to hear from our kids. What do they have to say about relationships? So pay your attention to the screen. Let's check it out. Um, sharing their toys. Wouldn't you be nice to them? If they talk to you and they don't try to like make you feel bad about who you are and they respect you and they don't just, and they are not mean to you. I don't know why I keep hesitating, but yeah. If they're nice and like a little bit of the same thing as Mary, actually, uh, yeah, I agree. Uh, and yeah. There's something nice for you? She would play with us. Being kind to each other and helping each other out. A friend who cares about you and that that's nice to you. Helping people? If they respect you and <laughs> they all, and they mostly make a decision that they both agree on. A good friend is someone you can look up to and have fun with. Like, you can give hugs to. Someone who is with you every step of the way and somebody who will hold your hand and just be there for you all the time. Isn't that great? I love that from our kiddos, yeah. Someone you can give hugs to. I think that's one of my favorite ones. That's great. I would add one more thing to the list of what makes a good friend. How do you have good relationships? It would be this. A good communicator or good communication. How many of you have realized like I have that when it comes to any relationship, everything rises and falls on good communication? 
Yeah, there's relationship experts named Les and Leslie Parrott, and they have a saying that says this, that the single greatest indicator to any success or significance in a relationship comes down to good communication. And many of us know exactly what that's like. When you're communicating well with the people you're in relationship with, man, things just seem like they're going well. Well, good. You're so in tune, you can finish each other's sandwiches or sentences, either one, right? I mean, you're playing ball with your friends on the court and you're communicating so well, you don't even have to tell them what to do and backdoor cut and you lob the alley-oop and you dunk on the other end. You're just, you're in tune with one another. You're so closely connected to your friend that you can respond to their text without even knowing what they're going to say. Of course I watched Dancing with the Stars last night and it was amazing. When communication is good, the joys are greater, the highs are higher. (laughs) But when communication isn't going so good, when it's going poorly, well, that's a different story, isn't it? You have conversations that are much different, such as who recorded over the NBA game with The Bachelor? I mean, how is that even possible? Or you have conversations like, why does it even matter how I fold the towels? They're towels. Just be thankful they got back in the linen closet in the first place. Or maybe you have conversations with friends. Everyone knows that when the defense is aggressive, you have to backdoor cut. That's like basketball one-on-one. Or how could you ever think that person would be the best choice for on The Bachelor? This is crazy. When communication is good, it's good. When it's not so good, well, it's really hard, isn't it? As a matter of fact, if pure communication is one of the number one sources of conflict in any relationship. (laughs) Experts go on to tell us this time and time again. But the reality is most of us don't need an expert to tell us that, do we? That many of us can all agree that we've been in spots where poor communication brought some significant conflict in our relationships and in our friendships. I'm sure that if you had time, you could tell some stories about how a misunderstanding started so small and then it blew up and you're like, where did that come from? Now you won't text me anymore? What's that all about? Or maybe a family member walked out because they just couldn't figure out how to communicate. Maybe a mom or a dad or a grandma or grandpa. For others of us, we're kind of left with the the short end of the stick because we didn't grow up in an environment, a foster home or a home or raised by our grandparents where we were really taught what it's like to communicate well with each other. So we're really doing the best with, with what we can, but realizing we haven't really made it there yet. It can be a pretty damaging thing when it comes down to poor communication. And again, all of us probably have a pretty good story that we could tell of how some poor communication did some significant damage in the relationships in our lives. That's the bad news. But here's the hope that we found from God's message today. God's Word gives us this brilliant principle and insight of how to have healthy Christ-honoring communication that kind of sets the tone for, again, any relationship you find yourself in. And if we actually live this out, I believe transformational things will happen in your friendships, in your marriage, in your relationship with your kids, in your workplace, with your neighbors, and yes, even with your barista. Really incredible things can happen. But before we dive into that today, I need us to do something, okay? We're going to dive into this practical wisdom from God's Word, but here's what I need to ask you to do. Everyone take this index finger. We've done this before. Everyone take your favorite pointer finger, put it up in the sky for a minute, and I want you to take that same pointer finger and put it right in your chest and repeat after me, this This is is for for me. Why? Because we're going to start talking about some stuff, and guess what you're going to be tempted to do? <clears throat> Clearing the throat, little elbow nudges. Are you paying attention, honey? Right? Are you taking notes? You're like, oh, this would be so great if so and so is here, and I wish they were here. And my friends, I love that, I get that, but here's the, the fear that I run into. You'll be so concerned about who else needs to hear this that you miss of what you need to hear from this. Of what God has to speak to who? To me. So here's my prayer. This is for who? This is for me, everyone. And we are going to do something I think is kind of fun. I'm an active learner. No one, none of you are surprised by that. So we're going to actually have some hand motions to remember three simple, not easy, simple principles that God through his word gives us to come to healthy communication, okay? And here's the first one. It comes from James 1.19, the one verse we're in right now. And what does that first one say, that first word? Everyone. That's right. So turn to your neighbor and tell him he's talking to you. He's talking to you. 
He's talking to you, and he's talking to me, all right? So here's what I need you to do. We're going to read this entire verse together on the count of three, but when we do, where it says everyone, I want you to put in your name, okay? Online, Peru, I want you doing this with me as well, okay? So it'll sound like this for Keith. Keith should be, everybody got it? Don't say Keith, say your own name, got it? On the count of three, one, two, three, Keith should be quick to listen. So here's the hand motions, ready? Don't hit your neighbor. Quick to listen, all right? Quick to listen, everyone, okay? Quick to listen. Now, here's the thing. Listening, even though it seems simple, can be kind of hard, can it? So you're like, I'm not listening to you now, Keith. So yes, I absolutely get it. I'll never forget the time that this was made abundantly clear to me. There was a time in my life about five or six years ago when one of my kids came up to me and I realized in this moment it was a wake-up call from God. I need to do a better job of hearing listening, and understanding my kids. My son Amos came to me. He was just about seven or eight at the time. And I don't know why it took me so long to hear this, but he said this phrase, and he must have said it a dozen times, but it took me about a dozen times of him saying it throughout the weeks before it finally resonated with me. Here's the phrase that my son would start almost every conversation with me with. Ready? Hey, Dad, I have to ask you something, but don't say no before I finish speaking. I was like, okay, no problem. You know, I heard it a few times. But then immediately, it started to resonate with me. I said, wait a minute. What am I actually hearing my son say? He said, Dad, if you could just let me finish my sentence, that would be great. (laughs) Hey, Dad, if you would just let me get all my words out before you give me an answer, I would really appreciate that very much. And what I realized in that moment, I believe it was an awareness from God. I was inadvertently giving my beloved son the message of what you have to say doesn't matter as much to me (laughs) because I already have my mind made up. So you can say all the words you want to, but the answer is going to be no, right? And I thought about this. Well, wait a minute. What message is that giving to my amazing one and only son who I love and cherish so much with all my heart? And it's at that moment where Holy Spirit reminded me of this verse and kind of tapped me on the shoulder and said, Keith, be quick. To listen. Listen. Genuinely, genuinely listen. To hear, to, to seek, to understand, to know what it is, the message that you're trying to convey. Not just to understand the words in my mind, but actually to in, understand the intent and the message, the meaning that you're trying to give me. And then that moment I felt impressed by Holy Spirit to do something that has been kind of a life changer in my relationship, starting with my son. And again, he was only seven or eight years old. It was this. I'm just going to do my best not to interrupt. Just not interrupt. So now at this time, and I'm not perfect in this. I'm a work in progress. Any other works in progress here, my friends? Anyone? Thank you. I feel much better. But I do my best to let my son complete his entire sentence, and then I say no. Just kidding, kind of, right? Just kidding, sort of. Sometimes as parents, we have to say no, don't we? That's, that's important. But, but my friends, this has been absolutely transformational. Just to not interrupt, to let someone who I love and cherish so much in a friendship, and a child relationship with your spouse, with people in the workplace, to just seek to hear and understand, to listen. You want to take listening to the next level. There's something that oftentimes psychologists and counselors talk about what's called reflective listening. And many of you have heard of this before. You want to take your listening to the next level. Ask reflective questions like, what I heard you say is, and is that correct? And is there anything else I'm, I'm missing? But my friends, listening, if you want to be a good communicator, listening is absolutely crucial. I don't care what your relationship is. Any relationship could benefit with more active listening according to what God's word says. And this idea of quickness, it literally means for us to be on the ready. Like, I can't wait to hear what you're going to say. I can't wait to receive the message that you have for us. And again, just in case you're wondering, uh, doctors Les and Leslie Parrott, uh, they say that, and this is mind-blowing the stat, but they believe that 98% of communication is listening. 98% Check it out yourself. Google Dr. Less and Leslie Parrott, 98%. Because if you listen well, it clears up so much of the pain and the drama of things that go when we don't listen well. There's a book that I would challenge you all to read, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. That's a a companion book called Emotionally Healthy Church. And I love this quote. I wrote it down because I don't want you to miss it. Check this out. Being heard is so close to being loved that for the average person, they are almost indistinguishable. 
So if you've ever wondered, how do I love my spouse more? How do I love my kids better? How do I love my parents? How do I show my love and appreciation for the friends in my life? Listening. Just listening. So everyone, let's do it together with our hand motions. Ready? Everyone should be quick to listen, right? That's right. You're getting better. Almost like a quick draw. Ready? On one, two, three. Quick to listen. Good. Good job. You didn't even hit anybody yet that I saw, right? So the first thing, being quick to listen. And what is the second thing? Say, I want to make sure that we get this. Now also be slow to speak. So here's our action. Quick to listen and slow to speak. Ready? Let's do it together. Ready? Slow to speak. That's right. Not slow of speech, right? Doesn't mean you have to talk with like a southern drawl or talk real slow like. Not nothing like that. But rather be slow to speak. And the impression that God's Word gives us here is this. Don't make quick judgments or assumptions. Anyone here ever make an assumption before? Just a few. I love how you all were like, no, not me, right? Somebody else did, right? Again, I'll never forget what this happened in my own life. I, I hope that personal stories help you because I have failed and am a work in progress just like you. But I'll tell a story about my other kid, uh, Anna, our eldest. There was a time where we were driving in Phoenix, and like I told you before, we pastured there for eight years, and it gets really hot in the summertime. So on one particular occasion, it was over 110, and for those of you who are familiar with Phoenix, it's not actually hot until it's 110 or more. So it was an actual hot day, and we stopped by a local convenience store to grab some big old beverages from the fountain drinks. And so sure enough, we all got one. You got to hydrate so you don't dehydrate, right? Everyone knows that. And so we brought our beverages, we put them in the cup holders in our car, and their Phoenix traffic was pretty intense that day. So I was trying to get out of the parking lot as quick as I could to beat oncoming traffic. What I didn't realize is I was going too fast, took the corner outside of the convenience store too quick, and I hit the curb. And I hit it pretty hard. I hit it so hard that the drink that was in the cup holder closest to my eldest, my daughter Anna, popped out of the cup holder and 44 ounces of refreshing goodness all over the upholstery of our van. Wonderful moment for a family. I don't know what your reaction usually is in moments like that, but I was frustrated. And so I turned around, looked at my daughter straight in the eyes and said, Anna, you got to pay better attention. <laughs> my wife is laughing because she knows what happened next. My, my daughter, so brilliant, looks back at me and says, um, Dad, that was your drink in your cup holder and you put it there. And I went, <laughs> my bad. My <laughs> Oh, that moment where if I just would have paused for a moment and actually lived out this passage, just being slow to speak, not making a quick judgment or an assumption, because not so great things can happen when you make a quick judgment or assumption, right? When you speak before you know all the facts, when you hear only one side of the story and you decide to make an entire storyline out of just that one side of the story, that can be such a dangerous thing, my friends. As a matter of fact, right before I came into service today, I found this incredible proverb and I was reading through it. Proverbs 18, 13. This is bonus material, my friends, not in the notes. So listen to this. Write this down. Proverbs 18, 13. Listen to this. Spouting off before listening to the facts is both shameful and foolish. Oof, boy. Why is spouting off before listening to the facts shameful and foolish? Because we can make a story out of some untruths that actually do some significant damage when we don't know everything going on, right? When we're not slow to speak. And how many of us have realized, just like I have, that there's immediate and incredible power in the words that we speak? As a matter of fact, a little later in Proverbs 18, there's this incredible passage. It's actually so powerful, we're going to take an entire... uh, weekend and and preach just on this because we got to dive into what it says. But I had to give you just the cliff notes today. Here's what it says in Proverbs 18, 21. The tongue has the power of, say it with me, life and death. I love how the message paraphrase puts this. Look at this uh, version of it. It says, words kill, words give life. They're either poison or fruit. What do the last two words say? You choose. Isn't that incredible? 
that you have the power of life and death just with the words that you speak. It's, it's these words that we speak have so much power, not just verbally, but in emails and what you post on social media. It's such an incredible thing. And again, many of us know exactly what it's like to have someone blow us up on social media or to our face or send out a hot email before they've made all the information or know all the facts, right? We know the pain of those moments. And God's word says, listen, listen, listen. The words you speak, they have the power of life and death. And some of us experience death in relationships because of some things that were said, some things that were done to us. And God's word says to us, since that's the case, be quick to listen and slow to speak. As a matter of fact, I'd I'd love to teach you just a, a little phrase that I think is so important for us to ask, especially in the volatile moments of our relationships that will make so, that will eliminate so much drama in any of your relationships. And here's what the sentence says. Here's what the phrase says. Are these words I'm about to speak filled with what? Life. Because your words, they have the power of life and death. They're either poison or fruit. You get to choose. Are these words that I'm about to speak, are they filled with, with life? And if some of you are looking back, Keith, but what about the hard things that we got to talk about? Because sometimes there's not always just easy things. we got to talk about discipline with the kids. You know, you can't be throwing toys at your brother and sister. I mean, that's just not a cool thing, right? And what if we have to have hard conversations at work or with my spouse or with my best friend who's kind of been avoiding me lately? My friends, let me make sure to remind you something. You can talk about hard things, but you can do it in a loving and life-giving way. As a matter of fact, Ephesians 4.15, another bonus verse. I'm giving you lots of bonus material today, my friends. It says this, always speak the truth and speak it in love. There's a pastor, I think his name is Steve Thomason, and says this. He says, truth without love is abuse, but love without truth is enablement. <laughs> Such an important thing for us to keep those two things in tandem together. So are the words that I'm about to speak, are they filled with life? So let's do our two motions together. Ready? Everyone should be quick to listen and slow to speak. Quick to listen, slow to speak. And what's this third one? Look at what it says. And slow to become angry. Ready? That's just, we're going to push our anger down. Ready? Slow to become angry. Let's do all three. Ready? We'd be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Anyone ever got angry in a relationship before? No. I'm angry at you right now, all right? Then there you go, you did it. It's interesting in me, there are these moments where this phrase, slow to become angry, it means to give full vent to your rage. This phrase seems to indicate it's not just a feeling of anger, it's when you act on the anger. And you act in the anger through the statements that you say, through the things that you do and your responses. And so when we're not slow to become angry, I don't know what you're like, but any time I've ever given full vent to the rage and anger in my life, I've yet to look back at that and say, you know what? I'm glad I did that. <laughs> As a matter of fact, much to the contrary, I look back and I said, why did I do that? Because there's so much collateral damage to pick up. There's so many things that I have to repair and the damage that I've been done when I give full vent to my anger. And I think how much better it would be if I was just slow to get angry. As a matter of fact, just the very next verse, it tells us why this is so important to God and our relationships. Look at what it says in verse 20, 19 and 20 again. It says this, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be ready, quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to get angry. And then look at the very next verse, human anger, well, this phrase is important, human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Keep, would you please keep that verse up just for a little bit? This phrase, human anger. It's important. It's this idea of things that I get angry about because I haven't had my needs met or I haven't been able to control things according to the situation that I want them to be. There's certain anger that we see present in the New Testament from Jesus specifically that's actually a good righteous type of anger. So when you see injustice in the world and human trafficking, there's a type of anger that's good in those moments. That's a godly anger. When things aren't as God intends them to be, but most of the time for us, There's a danger when it comes to the human anger, and it doesn't produce the righteousness that God desires. And and many of us can think back to our relationships and how an angry outburst did some significant damage, and we know exactly what this passage means. It doesn't produce the righteousness. We don't find ourselves becoming more loving and graceful and merciful 
when we just give full vent to the anger, we just let ourselves emotionally vomit on people and too bad for you, I'm angry and you're gonna feel it. Not usually a good thing in our relationships, is it? And I know for some of us, we're like, Keith, really cool, great. How in the world do I do that? It's not like when I'm angry, I'm thinking, you know what? I know this is bad for me, but I'm gonna do it anyways. So how do we actually live this out? And again, this is the subtle brilliance of God's message for us, if we let it dwell in us. My friends, you do the first two, the third one's a whole lot easier. In other words, if you're quick to listen, you're really genuinely wanting to hear and understand, you seek to understand rather than to be understood. You seek to hear what's really going on. And then you're really slow to speak. You're not making quick judgments or assumptions but rather you're hearing and understanding and you make sure that the words you speak are life-filled, not shameful and foolish words, but rather words of life. You do those first two and the third one isn't easy, but it's a whole lot easier. It sounds a little bit like this. Oh, so when you came home from work and you, you know, were in a huffy mood, you weren't really mad at me. Things were just going on with your boss and you're tired of all the overtime that you've been working and when that coworker said that thing to you because you paused to really listen and then you didn't spout off and say, well, you know what? I've got something to tell you. I don't like your attitude. And guess what? I never really liked your meatloaf either. <gasps> oh, no. Right? <laughs> but because you were slow to speak and you didn't say those things because that person feels heard and because you made sure you spoke words of life, Suddenly that anger that has a tendency of rising within you found itself not as present in your life. So here's a question I have for you, my friends. Look at your relationships for a moment. Which of those three would you say, Lord, I feel maybe a conviction on my heart? For me, it was the first two right away. <laughs> when my son, the Lord used him to, to talk to me about what would it look like for you to genuinely listen? What would it look like for you to be slow to speak? And for pastors, that's a really hard thing, right? Well, what about you? In those relationships in your life, maybe you pause for just a moment and think about one that's been kind of challenging lately. And what would that look like? Would it be a, a need for more listening? To genuinely not try to think about what you're going to say so that you can win the argument, but rather so that you can make sure that that person you're in relationship with feels heard. Maybe we need to slow down the words that you speak and not just say whatever comes first to your mind. Maybe for you, it's that anger that seems to rise up very quickly within you. And instead ask, Lord, I know this won't produce the righteousness that you desire for me, so help me to become slow to anger. What would happen this week in your relationships if you were oh, quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry? You think your relationships would be better, transformed? I think they would. I think they would. And I believe that that's what God desires for each and every one of you as well. I want to invite our praise team to come forward. We're going to end on kind of a high note today. Because my friends, I've got so much hope for you as you walk outside of these doors in just a little bit, as you log off in just a moment. There's going to be something incredible that God's going to give you an opportunity to do this very week, no matter what relationship you find yourself in, as you work in that art of peopling. Here's the question I have for you as we go into a time of prayer. What is that relationship, maybe the top one or two that God's been bringing to your mind today as you've been speaking about? It? Maybe it's a marriage. And maybe it is a friendship, a relationship with one of your kids, maybe an estranged kid, maybe someone in your workplace. Has God been breaking the specific relationship to your mind where you need to apply these principles? Maybe it's all of them, but there's one that's been at the top of the list. My prayer for you today is that as we go into this time of prayer and sing this song, you will just make your own commitment. Lord, help me to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry today. So would you please stand with me? We're going to do this together one big time, okay? And we're going to say it together. You can remember these words. There's just a few of them. Ready? On the, on the count of three. Ready? Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Lord Jesus, thank you for your promise today. That in the midst of this time, that we can know that your truth sets us free, that it brings life. And that's what I pray takes place in all of our relationships this week. And Lord, I don't know what every person is thinking about right now. But I know that every single one of us deals with other human beings. And as long as we do, there'll be hallmark moments and wrestling type moments and everyone in between. 
So no matter what our relationships bring this week, allow us to live out your call to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry and see the transformation that you will do as we follow your promptings, Holy Spirit. We believe you for it all, Jesus. We ask it in your name. And everybody said, amen.